Hello, hello. Good afternoon, Denver. Uh, thank you for your audience. Um, today's presentation is actually not the one that was advertised on Twitter. Um, I've decided to go a completely different direction. So the first one was something called Doubted Our Experiments in, in Liquidity. Um, but over the last few weeks, I've had a few, let's say, troubling conversations with developers. And I have decided to basically turn my current understanding of cryptocurrency as an industry into a fable, something you could explain to maybe a small child, a person who is first developing a cryptocurrency project, something like that. And so in order to avoid sort of pointing the finger at any projects that I see as being sort of a perpetrator of some of the myths that uh, I will be talking about today, we're going to be using a completely hypothetical uh, cryptocurrency um, which is just represented by these acorns, okay? And so for the purpose of this thought experiment, I want you to assume that these acorns are essentially fixed supply tokens, okay? Standard something like ERC-20. Now, for any market where we have uh, a fixed supply of something that is, is determining a price, of course, we need a way to determine that price, right? The, the resource itself is being traded between two different characters minimum. And we often um, represent in, in financial markets the people that are um, trying to sell a good, right? Trying to sell some, some currency or a, another store of value um, as a bear, right? And so it seems appropriate that in our fable that the person selling these, these acorns would be the bear character. And the bear is essentially uh, is, is characterized by the sense that they would prefer dollars over the thing that they are selling, right? They would prefer cash instead of having these acorns. Now the customer, the person on the other side of that transaction is the proverbial bull, right? The person that loves these acorns, they want to get their hands on as many of these acorns as possible, and they're willing to part with dollars in order to uh, obtain more ownership of these things. So this is the transaction, okay? The bull is exchanging dollars to the bear, and the bear is giving the acorns back to the bull. Now, because of their preference, okay, we can actually have a look at, from sort of a game theory perspective, what the incentives for each one of these characters is. If the bull, okay, um, is uh, very, very motivated, right, to buy lots and lots of these acorns, then of course the bear um, has an incentive to try and get the best possible price. Right? And that means driving the price of the acorn up over time. So as long as the bull isn't running out of steam, then uh, the bear is going to continue to up the price of the, the resource that they're parting with. And then, of course, the opposite to this situation is that the bear is too motivated to get rid of these things. Right? He has way too much of this resource, and he is overwhelming the, uh, the motivation of the bulls to buy that thing. So that's relatively easy to understand, and I hope that for most people in the audience, um, the reason why I chose bulls and bears is, is not too mysterious. But what I think is mysterious, especially from a developer standpoint, is what does the bull even want, right? Why are they purchasing those acorns? And this is mysterious because, um, and you know, it's also Im important from, I think, a project, um, a project development perspective. Because in general, when we're creating these tokens, we care about the price, right? I know that price talk is generally something that's considered distasteful. And I want to point out that in this presentation, I'm not referring to any cryptocurrency specifically. So this is an entirely hypothetical thing. SEC, please don't come after me. So what I have found is, and what is slightly disturbing, is that projects have decided that they don't understand the bull. And we're going to imagine a completely different character entirely. And so we have basically supplanted the role of the bull with the role of the squirrel. And the squirrel is a character that we understand perfectly well, right? Obviously, squirrels love acorns. But what do squirrels do with those acorns? We've created protocols where squirrels essentially are, uh, make an initial purchase for some number of acorns, and then they lock them away, OK? Can I get a quick show of hands? Who knows what I'm talking about? Right? Can anyone think of a cryptocurrency that you buy it once and then you are given an incentive to lock it up? Right? That you put it away for some, like, for some unknown reason. Okay? And maybe that, that project will then reward you with additional acorns afterwards. Surely you've seen this before. And I'm not going to mention any projects by name, but I, I'm going to assume from the, the uh, faces of the audience members that you know what I'm talking about. What's interesting is that in this scenario, the role of the bear has become something a little bit more abstract, 
right? And he can look on in distress as the squirrel is actually amassing more and more acorns, and that puts his role as the salesperson at risk. So let's assume that we've got a fixed supply, a very large collection of these acorns. I want you to think about what it means for these acorns to have a price, okay? And we're thinking about market capitalization at the moment. If we start with something like this, right, where the squirrel has a very small proportion of the, the acorns in the, in the market, and we assume that the rest of these acorns are now available for price discovery. That means that the bulls and the bears are battling it out, and the actual value for each acorn is known, right, because the overwhelming majority of them are currently available for trade. What happens when that squirrel keeps going, when he amasses more and more of these acorns over time? Now, a much larger segment of the market is without price discovery, right? Essentially, you now know the price of a smaller proportion of the tokens that are available for sale. Now, what's alarming is, in a lot of these projects, it is actually deliberately designed to exacerbate this process, right? They are trying to give the squirrels more and more incentive to keep amassing these tokens and keeping them out of the market. Now, one of the uh, justifications for that is that when the market is becoming diminishingly small, then we end up in sort of a scarce resource environment, right? And that means that potentially the vanishingly small quantity of the tokens currently available should support huge price appreciation. But it's a symmetric argument. If there is that potential for massive price appreciation, then there's also the potential for massive price depreciation. And in fact, when the market is losing confidence in, a, in any asset, right, it doesn't have to be acorns or cryptocurrency, it can be gold, right, it could be, um, you know, insurance bonds. Whenever something is becoming increasingly scarce, in general, the market shies away from it. They lose confidence in it, they no longer trust the price that they're given. And this is the part that is um, most important to, to myself, right, as, a, um, as the, the, um, the product architect of Bancor, is that it's not really the fact that the squirrel has ownership of these things. The market doesn't care about that. What the market cares about is that the amount that the squirrel owns hasn't been subjected to price discovery, and so they don't trust the price of the token overall. So what we're really looking at is this huge chasm between the liquid component, which the market has made up its mind on what its worth is, and then this illiquid component, that even though it has the same name as a part of the same ERC-20 contract, is actually a part of a completely different reservoir of, of value. And the question is, what is that illiquid component worth? And this is what I want you to consider right now. There's a hypothetical that I often give on AMAs, which is if we mint something like one million tokens, and then I sell one of them to you for one dollar, is our market cap now one million dollars? Right? Are the other 999,999 tokens now automatically worth $1 because I sold one of them to you for $1? There's no reasonable answer to this, but it's something that you should be considering because this is currently happening in the cryptocurrency markets at a very, very, very large scale. And it has hurt some projects that have subscribed to this bull thesis that having a scarce economy is positive. Now, in the most dramatic sense, you could say that that illiquid component is worthless. I'm not necessarily making that claim, but there is a strong argument for that claim. I think that it is better to say that that illiquid component has an unknown value. Okay. Remember this. Hopefully this was not controversial, right? When the bear has too many acorns and he's got too much motivation to get them off of his books, this is generally a price depreciation event. What you have to realize now is that eventually that squirrel is likely going to want to get rid of his acorns, and he has now taken the place of the bear. And so this leads to dysfunctional markets. So here's the thought experiment, and the purpose for this workshop is what can we do about that? If we want to keep these kinds of staking um, mechanisms intrinsic to the cryptocurrency economy, is there a healthier way to handle it? So consider this. When the squirrel purchases this acorn from the original stack, we can create a derivative of it at exactly the same time that we are calling, in this case, BNACRN. That BN prefix stands for bank on network. And this is a single-sided pool token that is fully insured for the value that it originally represented. 
And this is different, for example, from uh, like pool two uh, pool tokens, where you've got two different assets reflected under the same pool token. The Bancor pool tokens on version three represent exclusively one asset. They are denominated entirely in the acorns that the squirrel provided. And so now, rather than removing those acorns from the original stack, he has instead issued um, a, uh, a single-sided pool token that, um, that represents the acorns that he purchased, while the acorns that, that are there remain liquid for price discovery. Now, these liquid staking derivatives, they can be used for all of the normal stuff that you want to use staking assets for, maybe securing a network, right? Because these, um, these single-sided pool tokens, these insured single-sided pool tokens, are still denominated in the value of the token that was purchased. You can still use it, for example, um, to punish bad behavior. Slashing these pool tokens is just as detrimental to the squirrel's financial affairs as slashing the acorns themselves, for example. You could also use these, for example, in voting economics. Vitalik Buterin, sometime last year, in his blog, pointed out that there is this dichotomy in, uh, in DAO tokens, in voting tokens, where if you have purchased a very large number of these, you might suspect that it's because you think it's important that that DAO function well and that you're going to use those tokens um, to, to vote on important proposals. But if you're providing liquidity with it, then you're not voting with it. And that is, you know, that that um, decision is problematic, one, for the health of the market, or two, for the health of the DAO that you've invested in. And so we're trying to remove that necessity that the user has to choose one or the other, and instead that they can do both, provide liquidity and vote at the same time. And so this means that all of those acorns that the squirrel has collected can now be amassed in with the liquid component and replaced with a liquid derivative that has the same purpose. So this is one of the major premises behind Bancor's version three. And we think that this is a huge industry blind spot, and I'm not sure why people haven't spoken about it at, you know, at scale. Um, but it's not, you know, I would say that this is no longer uh, a point of speculation. Um, if you want, you can, uh, I, I encourage you to come up and speak to me after this presentation. I'd like to bring your attention to a couple of uh, crypto economic resources and cryptocurrencies that over the last 12 months have been damaged by their own popularity. The success of the project has been so great and so much of that native token has been staked away that the market lost interest in it because they can no longer trust how illiquid it has become. Yeah, so if we replace that, uh, that squirrel's component with a liquid derivative, then we might have much healthier markets and we can practice safe decks together. Now, if you would like to reach out to me about anything that I've mentioned during this presentation or all of the features that I haven't mentioned that are also a part of version three, please feel free to email me at marketbankor.network. You can also reach out to me on Twitter or Telegram. But thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. How is the uh, PEG um, insured, and how is it different than um, other kind of liquid staking like uh, conve convexes, like um, curve CVX pools? Yeah, yeah. So the the the, the curve pools are um, they're not really liquid, right? So the the, the CVX is being staked there. Um, isn't really being used to facilitate markets. You can't trade against another user's staked CVX, right, or another user's staked CV CRV. Um, so this is, more, this is something much more similar to something like a Uniswap v2 pool, for example, where let's say that you, you provide liquidity with both USDC and ETH, but you're using the ETH component you know, um, to, to stake on Beacon Chain, for example, right, to secure the network there. The problem is that the value of that pool token, because it's denominated in both USDC and ETH, um, and it's susceptible to impermanent loss, which is that you know, uh, divergence, uh, that price divergence cost of, of providing liquidity, because it's exposed to that, the, um, the security of the network is kind of threatened by the fact that the collateral that is being provided has a volatile value denominated in the token that was provided. So what do I mean by that? If you provide, let's say, 100 USDC and 100 ETH to a pool, um, and then the price of ETH goes up, the, um, the total valuation of your pool token is gonna be worth less than what, um, than what you would have had if you had just provided uh, that same stake to the Beacon Chain alone. But that is not the case on Bancor. 
on Bancor, the full value of your liquidity position is insured all the time. And so even if the price of ETH moves away from BNT, which is the thing that it's paired with, the network actually guarantees the value of the, of the whole stake as if you had hodled it, right? As if it had been staked in the beacon chain itself. So there is no uh, attack vector where you can just trade on the pool, for example, and, and adjust the, the value of the pool token in order to exploit some security mechanism in some other protocol. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not about maintaining peg. It's about ensuring the value of the liquidity provider's position. But I hope if that's not clear, I, I can elaborate on that further. Is that okay? Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then please give a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much.